Flory. I'm the director at Tim Mountain Conservation Center. Thanks for joining us tonight for Chris's Hawk Talk, um, a perennial favorite every year to help us brush up on our Hawk ID skills. Um, before we get started, I wanted to thank our program sponsors who are Hancock Lumber and Ragged Mountain Equipment, and they help us uh, sponsor all of these, uh, all of these programs. Um, so um, if you have been enjoying all of these, um, our Zoom programs over the course of the, of the past few months, um, we appreciate you joining us. We do ask, um, members are always free to all our events. If you aren't a member, we'd like to ask you to consider becoming a member, or you could even just go on our uh, website and there is a way to donate if you just think Chris did a spectacular job tonight and uh, wanted to uh, give a little money to to Mount to help us support um, all of our programs. Um, all right, so upcoming programs, of course, and Chris will talk about this, on Saturday, this is being followed by a Hawk Watch and uh, we'll get into the details of that. Then, then next week on Thursday night, uh, Rick Vanderpoel is, um, this is another two-part program. He's doing a program on fantastic fungi. And so PowerPoint presentation on mushrooms. And he, he is really, he knows, he knows his stuff when it comes to mushrooms and lots of other things as well. And then he is following that up next Sunday, that's over the Columbus Day weekend, with two, there's two opportunities um, I believe it's 9 to 10.30 and then 11 to 12.30. And we do ask for all of our field programs um, moving forward that you, you have to make reservations because we're limiting the size of the group due to COVID restrictions. So that's really important. You can um, give the yeah. office a call and, and sign up um, and we'll make sure um, that we save you a spot. So, um, and then after that, there's a couple more. We're doing a series on um, emergency preparedness in terms of energy going into the winter and looking at some alternatives from generators to backup systems for solar uh, arrays and so forth. And after a little foray this past summer where many people were out of power for two or three days, it's kind of a little warning of uh, what the winter might bring. So. Anyway, those are some of the upcoming programs, and we've got lots of other fun things scheduled throughout the uh, rest of the fall and early, uh, early winter. So um, anyway, so what we'll do is uh, I'll turn it over to Chris. If you have a question during the course of the talk, I would ask that you would use the chat feature at the bottom and just type in your question and I will will either save them to the end or I can uh, just keep an eye on it and interject with questions for Chris at an appropriate time. All right. So uh, on that note, Chris, I am going to turn it over to you. Oh, well, actually, okay. maybe, no, maybe you don't know Chris Lowy. <laughs> I can't imagine no one doesn't know Chris Lowy, but he is a uh, it has done programs um, for many, many, many years with Raven uh, programs, and he his hawk presentation is uh, world renowned. I'll say so. On that well, note, I, I'll turn it over to you, Chris. Well, thanks, thanks, Laurie. My Zoom skills are about to be world renowned. Yeah, uh, that I'm could not, be true. Right. I've got something on here that I can't get rid of. Um, so just give me. A, Give me a second here. It, um, is it the colored pencils, Chris? No, it's not the colored pencils. All of a sudden, this thing this thing came up. Um, okay. Let me uh, let me just try to try to get rid of it. What are you seeing now? Do you see me? Uh, yeah, we're seeing this. Uh, you haven't shared your screen yet, so we're still just okay. seeing everybody. Okay. Well, I'll. Um, I think that's part of the issue with the sharing the screen deal. It's not letting you share the screen? Um, it's, it's some weird, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Now you see me and not my screen. Is that right? Right. That We're just still seeing I'm, you. Thumbs yep. up for everybody. Okay, yep. great. Yep. 
Well, well, good. I'll um, I'll put I'll put my regular program on it in a, just a few minutes. But as a means of uh, introducing it, I've been doing this. Larry said, I, I, "This I think this was one of the first presentations that, that I ever did for Tin Mountain back in 1986, possibly." And um, I just have a love of um, of uh, hawks and, and and not just the, the birds themselves, but the whole experience of watching hawks. And I know that uh, that several of you uh, are, are experienced hawk watchers, and I just want to encourage everybody. Um, it's nice to get on and do a program and, and talk about them, but you don't really have to have a whole lot of experience. You don't have to know a whole lot about these birds to really get out uh, on your own or with somebody else and just just get your finger on the pulse of what's going on right now. It, I really think it is one of the most exciting things that I, that I do um, is to get out and watch these, uh, these birds. And of course, the more you do it, the more you, you have an interest in learning more about, about these birds. And identifying will emphasize that tonight. But again, that's, um, you know, the birds don't even know their names. A red-tailed hawk doesn't know it's called a red-tailed hawk. And you can still appreciate this thing. From, uh, from a distance, but it is nice to be able to get a label on the bird, because once you know that that's a sharp shinned or a Cooper's hawk, then you can find out all sorts of other things that people have, um, have found out. You know, sometimes people have spent their whole lives putting together information about, about what they've seen and, and watched and uh, speculate about a particular species. So I, I strongly suggest you don't get frustrated if you're not familiar with many of these species. We've got uh, about 16 or 17 species of birds that we'll talk about tonight. Um, doesn't seem like a whole lot of, um, of uh, uh, identification skills to separate 16 different species, but of course there's, uh, there's often a sexual difference uh, between male and female um, as far as identification goes. And also there's an age difference with adults and, um, and younger birds. So we'll, uh, we'll talk about those, those things. I don't mind being interrupted at all. Uh, Laurie's outlined the way you can go about that and please, I don't mind being interrupted at, at all. So we'll, um, we'll talk about a few things as we, we go. I'm gonna share the screen hopefully here and we'll, um, we'll, take it from, uh, we'll take it from there. Share and doesn't have what I wanted to have here. That's not it. There we go. Is everyone seeing that? Do you have my screen now? Yes, looks good. Okay, Charlie, thanks. Uh, yes, thanks. sorry. Great. <laughs> All right. So, um, so don't hesitate to ask any questions. I think some of the Thank jargon you. that goes along with, yeah. Chris, Laurie? turn. Why don't you turn your video off? Just to, okay. that I think should enhance. Okay. And maybe some people are having trouble with hearing. So I don't know. Talk louder. Turn up the volume. Maybe. Okay. All right. I'll 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 do that. Let me get rid of the uh, the video here. My my video. Yes. Yeah. is really there you go all right that should help all right hope hopefully that'll uh, that'll that'll help all right so let's talk a little bit about the the jargon um birds of prey is usually the term uh the term that's used for for these uh these larger uh birds most of which migrate um and it's a little confusing because there are many many other species of birds that are predator birds, but they're not considered birds of prey. So there's there's some some semantics involved with the, the terminology. But typically, when people talk about birds of prey, they're talking about owls and hawks, which used to be classified together in an order called Raptor. That included the owls and the hawks. But now we know that the um, the owls and the hawks are not very closely related to each other. And, um, and that's an important distinction that we might get a chance to talk about a little bit later. They were grouped together 
in an order together, thinking they were closely related because they look very much alike. They have the same tools. They have sharp talons. They grasp and they, they hold their, their prey, uh, their predators, and they, um, they tear their food up. And they were considered to be the, the same. But, um, but now we know that they're, they're not. So we divide them up. Owls and hawks divided it up. Raptors is a general term, uh, and it's not a scientific term. We sometimes, again, mistakenly refer to the owls as nocturnal birds of prey. And, um, and there are many owls that are, that are active during the day. So that isn't really very accurate. And uh, the diurnal birds of prey is usually what we refer to as, uh, as the birds that are flying during the day that are hawks. And I'm using the term hawks, generally speaking, to include also our ospreys and our harriers and eagles. Um, and that'll become a little bit, a little bit more, uh, more clear as we go along. There are two, we're going to talk about 16 different, and I, I suggest if you have any confusion and you really want to get a grip on, um, on separating these groups of birds, to just have a piece of paper and jot down a few things, about 16 different species. We're going to group them into uh, smaller categories to give you a little bit better handle on it. And that uh, is usually the way when you go out and watch hawks usually try to put them in a group first before putting a, a species name, usually in the genus that they're in. And that can be helpful to getting to exactly what they, they are. Well, this first bird, um, I think many of you will be able to identify as a very common bird, increasing in numbers over the, over the last uh, 15, 20 years. Um, they used to be uh, somewhat rare around here, but we have two species of vultures here in the, here in the east. And this is the turkey vulture, the more common that we see here. Although the black vulture um, that we'll uh, see in a second is increasingly making its way north. Turkey vultures um, are not very closely related to the other hawks. They, um, they apparently are more closely related to storks and herons. But they're still grouped together. We still watch them when we go out for a hawk watch. I particularly am fond of of uh, turkey vultures. They're, um, they're really tremendous flyers and um, they're still grouped in, uh, by, by many people and only separated by some ornithologists as not being true raptors because they only feed on carrion, uh, except the black vultures are known to take some, uh, some live prey occasionally. The turkey vulture is the bird that you draw as a as a kid in elementary school. It's just that little check mark, that little mark with a, of a V. Um, it's got a dihedral um, that is um, very pronounced. That's the wing tips. The outer tips of the wings when it soars are higher than the body. This is designed for slow flight. It's not a very stable flight. So you see them teeter and totter. So you can see a large dark bird from a couple of miles away and you know that it's a turkey vulture. Our large other dark birds don't teeter and totter back and forth. These birds get blown around a lot. And this particular individual, this speck that we've got here, has a trailing edge of light in this particular photo. Turkey vultures look black, they're actually brown, and these worn feathers often along the trailing edge of the upper wing are um, often quite, uh, quite light. Easy, after you get a feel for it, easy bird to identify. Um, and we should see quite a few of them over the, um, the next several weeks. This is the black vulture, close relative of the turkey vulture. This is the other vulture that we have in the, in the east here. And it's got a very different shape to it. Um, you can see both of them here. This um, individual, up here in, on the left, of course, is a turkey vulture with that um, under the primaries and, uh, and secondaries. Uh, it's kind of a silvery underwing lining, but mostly dark overall. Um, big, big bird, uh, fairly long tail. And the black vulture over here 
has a somewhat stubby tail. You can see it's at this angle, but it's true from most angles. It doesn't protrude beyond the back uh, edge of the, of the wing very far. And they do, and it shows up even in this terrible photograph from a distance, the white legs of the black vultures show up here. Uh, black vultures also have a dihedral, as you can see in this lower portion. And even in this terrible picture here, you can see the white outer primaries uh, of this bird. And that stands out when you get a good view. But typically we don't use field marks like that as the first uh, line of identification because we often see these birds at a great distance. So it's helpful to learn some other skills to enable us to, uh, to identify these things. But this is a good representation, these two birds here, black vulture on the right, turkey vulture on, on, the, on the left. Uh, turkey vultures will often um, have this uh, Dracula pose uh, perched in a tree. They perch for uh, quite a long time and then they're in the air for a long time. They only have to eat every few days. So um, they conserve their, their, um, their hunting energy and they soar around and they're one of the few species of birds that use smell to uh, help them find their, uh, their prey. And the other vulture that we won't talk about tonight because we don't have them here, we only have them out, out west, of course, um, everyone is familiar with uh, the California condor. And uh, that's a bird that has been um, recovered uh, somewhat in California and also um, um, been reintroduced around the Grand Canyon and they're doing, doing pretty well. An ancient species that used to thrive when North America was covered by huge mastodons. And this bird was, most ornithologists believe, was on its way out um, long before man really kicked it over the edge by, you know, really, uh, really reducing its uh, habitat. So a few other terms I want, uh, I want to mention here um, as a sideline. Uh, we might get a chance to talk a little bit more about this, but I do want to go th through and emphasize the identification of, of these birds. But um, terms often, they always arise from a need for discussion on some level. And I, I think to be aware of some of the terminology associated with these, these birds, it helps us to have some insight into um, how they make their living, how spectacular they they really uh, they really are for instance i mentioned the uh, the word uh, raptor that that comes from the latin repere which um we get a couple of our uh, very commonly used words from um rapture uh, uh like the rapture of the deep or the, we're in a rapture where we're, we're our emotions are, uh, are grasped um and also the word rape uh, we, we get uh, grasping and holding and forcing and, and uh, rapier, uh, another, another term that we, uh, that, that we use associated with that Latin. And I think it's interesting because that, that has evolved along with the way we had looked at these birds of prey. Um, they were taught, thought to be vermin uh, for, um, for ages and um, successfully uh, they were hunted and trapped. There were, there were um, bounties put on them and just a terrible history of how we treated these birds. Uh, they were thought to be um, uh, the, the work of the devil. They, they took people's farm animals and chickens and so forth. We didn't understand the value of predation. Um, we also, on the other hand, um, just like the, the two ends of the spectrum with, uh, with the word uh, raptor, rapture and rape, we... Uh, we thought, many cultures thought of these birds as uh, messengers of the gods, are gods themselves. They flew in the heavens. Um, and you, you get a feel for how majestic these birds, uh, these birds are in the, in the environment. So I can easily, uh, easily see that. So let me just mention um, before going on, uh, convergent evolution here. Um, convergent evolution is uh, the term that is used to describe genetic material that has um, 
has that looks alike like the owls and the hawks they they have come from separate ancestry but they have evolved to look and act very similar because they've answered the demands of their environment uh, although they started with different material they came up with the same source um, some sometimes people refer to the human heart you know we have a four chamber heart birds have a four chamber heart we have very different ancestry but that's a darn good machine that is efficient as a pump so that particular organ uh, is an example of convergent evolution it converged to answer the demands of the environment and and that's just the tip of the iceberg as far as talking about these things the opposite of convergent evolution so to speak is adaptive radiation when one species goes in different directions and occupies different niches and is pressured by different aspects of the environment they end up um being more successful with by being larger or by being smaller or by being faster but they start at one point and they radiate in different directions so that's what we can see when we talk about uh the buteos the four species of buteos that we have here at one point they were the same bird and then some were more successful by being a little bit the larger ones bred with other larger ones and they were more successful or the smaller ones occupied a slightly different niche and they were more successful so that's adaptive radiation another term that often comes up when we're speaking about hawks is asynchronous hatching and uh, this is a great strategy that is particular to the raptoral or the predatory way of life when uh, an adult uh, female osprey lays an egg, she does not, she will, will start uh, brooding it immediately. And then the next day she'll lay another egg and she'll continue brooding both of them. And she'll lay another egg the third or fourth day and she'll brood them. Now, when you have ducks, they lay an egg and then they'll lay another egg and in a few days they've laid 12 and then she'll start brooding them so they all hatch synchronously if a duck had asynchronous hatching like the hawks do where they've been they've been cooking in the oven for several several different days and a day is a big deal with these uh with these uh these birds they will start hatching the first one that's that was was being brooded will hatch out sooner and get fed sooner and get the share, lion's share of what's coming into the nest. Whereas the ducklings, they all hatch out the same. The mother can watch them all. They're precocious. They're out wandering around. And it would be ridiculous for her to try to keep a brood of 12 under her wing if they all hatched out separately and were all different sizes. So it's a strategy that we see in the birds of prey to at least because of their need to prey on other species that might be abundant one year, but not so the next. This allows a pair of hawks to get at least one healthy bird out of the nest, hopefully. Because the one, if there's not enough food, that last one that hatches out is smaller and doesn't have the opportunity to feed. This makes sense to, to, to most of you. This last, um, uh, and an acronym here, RSSD, refers to reverse sexual size dimorphism. Uh, we might get to talk about some of the reasons for that, but it's important to note that most, most, almost all species of raptors, the female is larger than the males. And there's a potato. This is reversed from normal birds. Most birds, the male and female are about the same size, or the male is slightly larger. There are some. Um, some differences uh, that come up, some exceptions to the rule. But with the raptors, raptors, both owls and hawks, even though we know they come from different ancestry, express this reverse sexual size dimorphism with the females being larger than the males. So that tells us something. It's not from ancestry. It's not just that all oh, the females in our family have always been larger than the males. It doesn't work that way. This is because of the way of that predatory lifestyle that they have. There's an advantage to that. And it's fascinating to look closely at that. We might get a chance to talk about that. 
All right, let's let everyone with me. Everyone um, doing all right? Okay, good. I have one response, and I think yeah, we're okay. We're good. Okay, good, Paul. <laughs> um, so um, the first group of birds that we'll we'll talk about are the buteos. That's the genus buteo that these are in, and we have four out of the 16, 17 birds we're going to talk about. Four of them are buteos. These are the broad-winged birds. They um, are often seen soaring. Many of them hunt from, uh, from soaring. And we're going to just quickly go through some of the field marks and different behaviors of this group of buteos. Our smallest buteo is the broadwing hawk that you see here. And the, um, the adult broadwing uh, has this uh, heavy, it, it's actually barring um, uh, on the uh, on the breast here gives it a reddish look and the immature bird um, has streaking and doesn't acquire this um, until it's out of its juvenile plumage. Broad wings um, in both uh, sexes and uh, in ages have uh, the outer wing is black. Almost the wingtips look like they've been dipped in, in black. Immature birds do not have the broad white bands that you see here. So uh, there are other species of hawks that have these white tail bands, but the broad wing is the only one that really stands out that you see relatively few of them. As you can see in this, you only see one broad white band below the, the feet and under tail coverts of, of this, uh, this bird. The broad wings are fascinating, uh, fascinating uh, beauty -o. Smallest of the buteos, here's an adult broadwing. Um, they migrate pretty much all at the same time from eastern North America, all up uh, Canadian Maritimes down through, and they will go all the way down into Central um, and into the South South America. Um, interestingly enough, they go typically during the teen week of September, just before front, just after front. This year. Uh, the 12th of September uh, was a, a big day and both ages, uh, all ages and both sexes just picked up and left the Northeast here on the move. Uh, the 12th was a big day. Uh, the second big day was the 15th. And now we are just seeing them show up in, uh, in Southern Texas. Um, they go all together like this. Of course, when you're in a large group, there's, there's an issue with competition. Uh, so these birds, not concerned about the competition for food, they don't feed much on the wing, but they have an advantage to flying all together because they go a long, long distance in a relatively short period of time. There's an immature broad wing here. They will go all the way down to Central and South America and they will use very little energy so they don't have to feed very much because they don't cross over water. They fly over land and they use thermals. Warm, doesn't have to be what we would consider warm. It just has to be uh, air masses that are warmer than the surrounding air masses. So these birds will rise on these rising air masses when they get to the top, they peel off and go in a southerly direction until they pick up another thermal. They don't fly over water because water absorbs heat. Land reflects heat. So you don't get water flood, you don't get thermals uh, coming off of, of water. So the advantage to flying all together, and many of you, of course, know this, this is Ornithology 101. The advantage is these, these birds and us, we can't see what thermals look like from a distance. Saturday, we'll look out and we'll look for thermals, but you don't see them unless there's something in them, unless there's another bird in them rising to the top. So it's to their advantage to all go out, they all spread out and they say, hey, Roger over there, he's found a thermal, look at him go. And they fly over there, they join that thermal. By the time that they're, they're going over Panama, there are millions of these birds in the sky at once. It's awesome, unbelievable. They pack up and leave. And this young broad wing is looking back at, um, through my window at me here. 
And of course, birds move their heads like that. Most birds move their heads like that because they have huge eyes and they have reduced the amount of muscles that are involved with looking. We, we have such a great advantage with our eyes. We can look left and right and up and down. Um, they have gotten rid of many of the muscles and have gone for size for light uh, gathering capability so that they're great seers, but they have to move their head to get some depth perception. Another broad wing, young broad wing, see that streaking. Um, the next Budio, a little bit larger than the broad wing, also with a banded tail, but the bands, the white bands are finer. Um, this, this is the red shouldered hawk that we, uh, that we have here, and they increase in numbers as you get further south. Any of you that spend some time in Florida in the winter know that uh, red shouldered hawks are really all, all over the place there. And this, uh, this graphic isn't really, uh, let me go back to that. This graphic isn't, uh, isn't really accurate here. Um, one of the distinguishing characteristics of the red-shouldered hawk are these outer windows that um, it's just uh, lets a lot of light through the feathers at the base of, um, well, it's, it's part of the primaries actually, um, lets a lot of light through. And it, it's, this is the immature bird in the bottom and the adult at the top, and that should be just as pronounced with the bird at the top, and it's not in this uh, particular graphic. This um, red-shouldered hawk, this is a Florida bird, they're, they're lighter in color overall. He's got a snake, you can't really see him, but he's got a snake wrapped around his talons there. They're, um, they're lowland um, wet area feeders for the most, for the most part. They uh, fly very much like an occipiter, the next group of hawks we're going to talk about. Uh, they have a, a long, they have the longest tail of all the Budios. And, and when I say long like that, I mean compared to their, their wings. So when you look at it, it looks long. That's what we're really concerned about. And they have somewhat of a flat flap and they'll glide. So this is the Budio that sometimes mimics, uh, it looks to us and confuses us sometimes. And maybe being an occipiter. We'll talk about the occipiters in, the, in just a minute. But they're handsome birds. You can see where they get their name. Um, uh, the red shoulder here along the patagium. Patagium is this section of the wing. Uh, it's a, the bony structure that uh, the skin is stretched over that and it gives that airfoil shape to give flight to any, any, any bird. Um, and here are the, uh, the windows, very pronounced here. There's just this very light um, handsome, handsome uh, uh, bird that we that we have here. That's the next uh, larger of the uh, the Budios. Another look at the red-shouldered hawk. There's another red-shouldered hawk. They're pretty photogenic when you get a, a good uh, good look at them. And another um, one from down below. Red-shouldered. Again, uh, a beautio. And even at the, in this terrible photo, you can still see those crescent-shaped windows. When you can see those, that's pretty diagnostic. And in this picture, it, it really, it's, th this, this picture is anything you'd hang on your wall, but it's a great picture of a distant red-shouldered hawk. Look at how long that tail looks like. Almost confusing with um, an occipiter that all have long tails. Well, the next largest of our uh, Budios, actually he's, he's the heaviest, but um, not the, the broadest uh, wingspan. This is a very common, one of the most common um, hawks across the country, the red tail hawk. Isn't that common because they're very successful at what they, they do and they, um, they can occupy a number of different habitats. Typically our red tails in the east are um, dark headed. Um, they're probably the most melanistic of all of the hawks that we have. We have a variety of different colors, even here in the east, but you can find some places in the country that the red tail hawks are completely black. You can find some that are completely white and um, everything in, in between here. Typically our uh, red tail in the east has, um, is dark headed and has a belly band. This is an immature bird. I can tell that because it has very, very uh, slight um, stripes on the, on the tail. 
um, always a dark patagium. And here at the wrist of the bird or the carpal area of the bird, um, there's a comma that often is presented. The adult, of course, has a red tail and that's where it gets its name, red tail hawk. This is a good picture to, to look at uh, a red tail because it also has a slight dihedral. Uh, doesn't doesn't um, fly with its wings flat and will often hover like it's doing here. And you can see the wingtips are just, uh, 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 just up as this bird is hovering. Hovers like a rough leg will hover like this, a kestrel will hover. Um, they, um, they're not, the red tails don't really hover, they pretty much hang and kite in, uh, in the air. And um, this is probably a pretty good picture to, to show all large birds, not just birds of prey, but all large birds um, will have separated primary feathers. Each feather acts like its own um, airfoil, acts like a small, a small um, wing. And here's the red tail showing that pronounced dihedral the shape to it. All of these little cues might not stand on their own, but from a distance, when you start to put two or three of them together, you get a pretty good feel for what you might be looking at and can watch it come towards you at certain times of year. The overall largest, biggest size, not the heaviest, but the biggest size um, of the Budios that we have in the east here. And we, um, they're Arctic nesting birds and they'll come down from the north and we see them um, mostly during the winter here and some on migration. This is the rough leg hawk. You see it gets its name rough leg because um, the tarsus are fully feathered all the way down, all the way down to the toes. They have a very small bill and they have relatively tiny talons compared to the red tail hawk, the, which is overall a little smaller than this bird, but they feed on small rodents. So anything big like the red tail can take a can take a snowshoe hare. Um, uh, it would uh, it, it it would not be appropriate to try to tackle a snowshoe hare with small talons like this. And bigger talons allow small mammals like this to escape. So that's the rough leg hawk. Uh, I'm going to have my email at the end of the program. And if you send me an email, I'll send you um, a PDF of a a, a handout that has these birds all laid out and helps to take away some of the confusion if, um, if you're having any. Uh, this is a dark phased rough leg hawk. Some of our species, broadwing has a dark, it's unusual. I've only seen two um, all dark broadwing hawks here in the, in the east. So it's relatively rare for them, but it's more common for rough legs, all, all dark. You can see how tiny his, uh, his feet are here and how the feathers come, uh, feathers come right down to, uh, to the toes. Handsome, handsome bird. We've had them on Christmas counts here. Be interesting to look back and see when the, the last, uh, last time we had them, but we had them um, on some Christmas counts here in the, the Tin Mountain Christmas count. So this is the silhouette of the Budios. Those four species that we just talked about, they pretty much look like that. If you showed someone this uh, silhouette, they wouldn't be able to tell you what species it was, but they should be able to tell you that it was a Budio in the Budio um, genus. Okay, any questions about the Budios? We'll move on and morph this silhouette into an exhibitor. Look how long that tail is. Shorter wings. This is a true forest hawk. We have three species here in the east. And they use that tail as a rudder, so they actually will chase birds through the forest, maneuvering through shrubbery and, and branches. And they're very successful at being a bird hawk, generally speaking. They're the true hawks. And our smallest is the sharp shin hawk, very common bird. And this is a bird that's probably peaking right now as far as the migration goes. Of course, all these birds migrate at different times according to their food source. And as our small passerines are leaving North America, um, we have a, about 75% of our small birds will leave the area. As these birds are leaving, these birds' food is leaving, so they follow along. And uh, the sharp shin hawk, you can see, look at the size of those talons compared to the, 
the um, rough leg that we just talked about. These birds want to throw out a big net and grab on. They can take a they can take another bird the same size as they they are. And there's a fairly big difference between the females and the males. The males are not much bigger than a than a, a blue jay, and the females are bigger than bigger than that. And uh, and they can uh, a male can easily feed on a, a bird at same size. So the sharp shin hog, these are the birds that often come into feeders, um, buzzing the feeders and scattering the, the birds. Sharp shins are uh, light and they're buoyant. They flap several times and then sail, flap, flap, sail with a squared off tail. And uh, their angles can be at all different, um, different points. So it's hard to just uh, look at one silhouette and see what you might be uh, looking at, but you look over at the overall behavior of the bird and um, it, it gives you a pretty good, uh, pretty good idea which excipiter it is as it's uh, quite buoyant in the, in the air. And they have a fairly small head compared to the next species we're going we're gonna to talk about. So this is the sharp shin uh, streaking again on the immature bird. This is a young bird, and I can tell it's a young bird because it has a yellow eye. In the occipiters, uh, the younger birds have yellow eyes, and they get to be a deep ruby red the older they, uh, the older they get. This bird has a little bit of um, uh, the, the, the tail feathers here have a slight white line. It's not really pronounced much, um, and in the hand you can see it like this, but uh, this was a, this was a a female sharp shinned uh, hawk. From a distance, long, the long tail shows up in the bird on the left, and something that is, um, is a good identification tool with the occipiters, totally flat wings when they're gliding, totally flat. You can see that in the bird on the, uh, on the right. This next species of excipiter, the next larger excipiter out of the three of, in the excipiter genus is the Cooper's hawk. And the Cooper's hawk is, used to be, I can remember reading articles that would come out all the time on trying to distinguish between sharpshins and Cooper's hawks. And there were all sorts of, not arguments, but investigative tools, uh, how you can tell and so forth. And it's really not that difficult when you're not just comparing plumage. Plumage is very, very similar between these two species, but they're quite different. Um, the Cooper's is a much more robust, strong flying bird. I would not call it buoyant and flappy in the air. Um, they uh, have a, somewhat of a bull-headed appearance. Uh, the head is fairly big and the tail is rounded. And you can often see this definite white band at the base of the, uh, the Cooper's, Cooper's hawk. This is, a, this is, a, this is getting to, to be beautio size and not, uh, not really buoyant bird that gets blown around a lot. So um, the Cooper's, the middle size of the, uh, of the excipiters. And here's a Cooper's hawk here. They used to be, I don't know what the numbers are now, maybe, maybe Charlie or Will know the numbers, but they, they used to say that the, the counts come out to be, um, you know, for every 75 sharpshin, you see about 25 Coopers. They're in the minority of, um, of the excipiters. I don't know if that is varied uh, uh, much, and it might have to do with identification skills too. This is uh, something interesting that I want to, point out to you. These, this white here, these are undertail coverts, and we see them in several species, and they often will, will uh, be very loose and float up, and sometimes they appear as a white rump on excipiters, and that can be confusing because we do have a bird that does have a white rump that we kind of look for as a, an ID, but um, this, this can be something that fools um, some people at, at first. There's Cooper's big headed long tail. Um, really, 
really an interesting bird. I had a friend who was a falconer around here, um, Mike Gregson, years and years ago. And uh, he used to work with acceptors. And he, he said they always had somewhat of a primitive feel to them, um, uh, particularly the goshawk that he had. And he, uh, he hunted with his goshawk. And this is the largest of the acceptors. What have we we've got here for eye color? What does that tell us about the age of this bird? It's a young bird, young bird. Um, goshawks, they get their name from goosehawk. These birds are capable of feeding on geese. I mean, that's a big, big bird to take down and they're, they're much smaller than a, than a goose. They have a, a white superciliary line that's over the eye. This is a big, aggressive bird. Um, and we have them nesting in big old growth pine trees around here. Uh, there's an older goshawk. See, the color of the eye has changed here. Still the, still the white stripe over the eye. And um, I know some of you have gone out um, looking for nests, and these birds will easily attack you. Um, our good friend Chris Costello, who might not be that friendly after not joining in tonight, I'll be calling her and reprimanding her for that. Um, I don't see her in there. Uh, but she uh, she works with goshawks, and she has actually had them hit her head and um, and draw blood. They're really aggressive um, during the mating season. And uh, it's another goshawk. Look how long that tail is. Um, and when I say long, you want to look and and make your judgments compared to the rest of the the body of the of the bird. Wonderful bird. See how long the tail is compared to the tips of the wings. Here are the wings here folded back. Look at that tail. Whoa. And that gives a great steering ability when it's flying through through trees. Handsome, handsome bird. This could confuse you, could confuse anybody, um, at thinking it might be a beautio. Because although that tail is very long, the wings are somewhat long. And from certain angles, it looks chunky and not so much like an exhibitor, but more like a beautio. Look at this lower left picture right here. That easily could be mistaken for a beautio. Chunky, broad winged bird, but this is the northern goshawk, the largest of our exhibitors. So we have three exhibitors, four beautios, and we have three, three or four falcons. And this is, the, this is what a falconer is called, the long wings. This bird is designed, this group of birds, this genus of birds is designed for speed. Um, the, uh, the largest one that we have here uh, much of the time um, is the, uh, the peregrine falcon. We'll talk about that. But that's considered to be the, the uh, fastest animal in the world. So they're, they're really fast and they feed um, uh, the, primarily on, on other birds, although the smallest one, as we see here, the American kestrel, uh, feeds uh, primarily through the summer months on insects, on large insects. It used to be called a sparrowhawk, so they do take small, small, um, small uh, passerines. So the uh, kestrel has got to be one of the handsomest birds. It's made the cover of many field guides. Uh, the male kestrel, much smaller than the female, has blue wings as you uh, can see here, the female brown wings. These are the birds you see along wires. I bet many of you are familiar with, with them and probably seen them, whether you knew if they were kestrels or not. Um, handsome, handsome birds. And uh, they will hunt often from uh, the wires and then fly out over a field and they'll hover like a hummingbird. And then uh, it's, it's not true hovering like humming, hummingbirds, but it looks like that. And then they'll, um, they'll dive on their, uh, on their prey. All of the falcons can express this um, interesting uh, light pattern at the trailing edge of their, their wings, almost like diamond shapes there when you have the light shining through. So that's not diagnostic of, of any um, particular species of falcon, but it, it does show up in all of the, all of the falcons. That's the um, American kestrel, one of my favorite birds. And to give you a a uh, uh, variation in size here, a size difference. That's a, a male kestrel on the right, and on the left 
is an immature red tail hawk. So it gives you, it's a huge, huge difference that red tails about a four foot wingspan. Um, and the kestrel is down to, down to inches, 12 inches or so. Uh, the next falcon that we, uh, that we have here in the east is the merlin. They're, they're really just about the same size as the kestrel, but they're large, they're uh, chunkier, they weigh more. So, and they have a different behavior in their, in their flight. Kestrels are very buoyant and they'll flitter around, they'll come through a hawk watching place and they'll perch and then fly around a little bit. Typically the merlins come through uh, like a bullet and have, they've, got, they've got something in their mind and they go straight through, sometimes called the chocolate falcon. They do have a, a white eye line over their eye, um, really a handsome, handsome bird. And this upper left bird, I couldn't tell you what falcon it was, but it looks falcon-like to me because of its silhouette. Big headed, tapered tail. That was uh, on the Tankamagus Highway a million years ago. And the largest of our falcons that we typically have here is the peregrine falcon that gets a lot of press. Peregrine means wanderer. And these birds go long distances in search of prey. And research has showed they spend very, very little time hunting. When they see something, they go and they get it. Typically, they're usually quite successful. Peregrine falcons, great um, reintroduction story that we don't have time to, to get into here, but the White Mountains of New Hampshire was the, uh, the location that um, years ago, Cornell University decided to reintroduce the birds because historically our cliffs here had, uh, had successful nesting sites then DDT knocked their populations down. We lost all, all of the peregrines in the east. And they were reintroduced um, through a, a multi-year program of hacking, um, taking falconers techniques and putting young birds that were taken out of nests or hatched elsewhere out on nests and fed um, chickens without letting the birds know that they were being fed by humans. And then, like many birds, they have a sense of philopatry and they come back um, to where they, they hatched out. And now we, we have a successful population of peregrines in the East. Great success story. All right, so, so just a quick review. We have a few more to go through. Quick review, we have four Buteos. We have three Exhibitors. We have three Falcons. Sometimes in the winter, rarely, um, uh, a jeer falcon, which is a northern bird, an arctic bird, uh, will show up. So it's a possibility. Sometimes in a program on eastern um, hawks, you'd include um, a jeer falcon, and they're uh, just spectacular, and they're they're larger than the, the peregrines. But um, chances are slim we're going to see one um, over the course of this migration here. So um, moving on to birds that are um, the only birds in their um, in their their genus, and we have the osprey, of course, one of uh, one of our favorites. Great to watch. We have um, uh, here in New Hampshire, we have some successful osprey uh, nesting areas. These birds feed pretty much um, entirely on on fish. There are some instances where these birds have been seen to take other things. I did my graduate work on ospreys and I, um, I really uh, tried to read everything I could read about them while watching them uh, one whole summer. And they have been known to, uh, to feed on um, chickens and small rodents uh, in, um, in dire need, but primarily uh, they're designed for fish. So they're designed to fly over water. You can see that crook in the wing, kind of gull-like uh, an overwater design. They hunt by hovering over the water. They can go uh, four to five feet deep after fish, whereas a bald eagle will just, just pick up the fish off the surface and only get its ankles wet. Ospreys will turn the fish. Many of you have seen that. They turn it like a torpedo, so it's more aerodynamically uh, streamlined, and they'll fly to a perch and, uh, and feed on it or bring it back to their, uh, their nest. Um, really incredible fishermen so good that often bald eagles will steal the fish um, 
from the ospreys because they're more successful, particularly in rough water when, when um, the, uh, the eagles don't see the fish at the top, the ospreys can dive deeper and, uh, and get, these, uh, get these, these fish. So this, this um, behavior that bald eagles use when they steal fish is sometimes called piracy, makes sense. And another term for it, uh, it's a good term to, to know, um, uh, kleptoparasitism. The next time you're at a cocktail party and someone, someone tries to take your glass of wine away from you, Marge, you call them a kleptoparasite. And I guarantee they'll leave you alone. They won't bother you any, anymore. Kleptoparasitism or piracy. And uh, the eagles can do that because they're a, a larger bird than the osprey. Look at that majestic bird. Just incredible. And these birds that nest here in New Hampshire, they um, are flying south now. There's still some birds on the move. They've been on, on their way for, for a while, a few weeks now. They will fly all the way down to the Gulf Coast and they head out over the Gulf of Mexico. And in some cases, they will fly nonstop uh, 18 hours uh, over the Gulf of Mexico until they hit the coast of Venezuela. And then they will go down into South America. Many of our New Hampshire ospreys will winter in central Brazil. And some have even been recorded as going all the way down to the lower portion of um, Tierra del Fuego, down, uh, down uh, lower portions of Argentina and um, Chile. Um, Paul, maybe you've made it down, all the way down uh, to that, uh, that part, of the, part of the world. And um, it's amazing when you think of that. And then these birds will make their way back and they come back in March. I have this bird that's not an osprey, but I have it here in the osprey section because this is a crow. This was my crow that I, um, that I, I injured bird that I raised. And he, I just happened to catch his picture when he's, he's covering his eyes with his nictitating mem bird membrane, eye membrane, nictitating membrane. And this is a membrane that protects the eye. It moistens the eye and predatory birds have them also. And they will, shut these eyelids that's seen in slow motion photography just before making a kill. If, if a, it's a violent experience for these birds to, to actually make a kill, whatever they're preying on. And if their eye gets scratched, then that's it. They're out of, they're out of luck. There's not much recovery from that. And the ospreys use their, their um, uh, nictitating memories, membranes like goggles. They can actually see under the water. Loons do the same, same thing. So that's the nick. That's nothing out of the, out of the, the Shining or, or um, any other horror movie. Ospreys uh, will uh, will dive from a uh, 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 hundred feet um, and uh, right into uh, the water, going uh, totally un underwater. So they not only have to see the fish, they have to calculate. You all know when you put a paddle in the water when you're canoeing. The, it looks like the paddle bends. So the, the object that is in the water, because of the speed of light um, changing through the water, it gives a different appearance. So they have to calculate that. Ospreys have another interesting adaptation that I just want to mention here because I think it's great. They have, um, like all of the birds of prey, uh, four talons. Only the ospreys can have two talons in front and this toe right here is a reversible outer toe. Um, and they can bring that back to join the hallux, the hind toe. So they can have two in front and two behind, makes them uh, much more successful at holding on to their, to their fish. They often look like their, their wings are broken. Um, osprey, uh, os, uh, like osteopath, uh, osteoporosis, uh, bone. Um, is the root of the word, and uh, and prey is there. It's either bone breaker or broken bone. Um, the name uh, is derived. This is a bird you can tell the individuals if you're watching nest, which I did for um, much of my research time. Um, the uh, the breast of the birds, uh, dark breast marked like this, is a female and the cleaner breasts of males. Um, they'll have some markings and you can tell the, tell the differences um, between the ind individuals here. Handsome, handsome birds, 
long distance migrants. You can look up online New Hampshire Ospreys, and um, Ian McLeod is involved with um, putting uh, satellite telemetry on these birds, and you can actually follow the birds on their route uh, south and what they do. It's just incredible because you can tell that there's some water in an area they'll stay in for a few, uh, few, um, few days before moving on. So that's the osprey. Um, it's the only member, not only of its genus here in the east, it's the only member of its genus anywhere. It's the only, it's in the only genus in its family. It's the only member of its family. So, and family means that all birds that are in the same family are very closely um, uh, connected genetically. And if a bird is only the only one in the family, it's speculative to think that it just does what it does very well and there was no reason to speciate and go in different directions. So it is what it is. So the osprey is the osprey. It's unique um, and uh, it's very successful. It's on all continents in the world with the exception of the Antarctic. Our next bird that's, um, we have others in the genus, but we don't have them here in North America. Uh, this is the Northern Harrier. We have other Harriers, but not here. Um, this is a, just a wonderful, handsome bird. Um, these birds we might be able to see over the next uh, several days. They almost look owl-like because they use hearing to uh, hunt with. They fly low over fields often, and they'll feed on um, small rodents, um, nesting birds, um, they have long wings, they fly with the dihedral, and this is the female here, and she has, um, uh, she has several, several chicks, and this is the only species of, um, of hawk that we think is um, uh, polygamous, gen as a general rule. You'd have one male with several uh, several females, and it possibly has a lot to do with the habitat, the very productive marsh habitats. Quite a difference in appearance between the females and the males. This is the male here um, in all, the, all these pictures here. Ghostly white from underneath here, uh, kind of a ghostly gray on the upper, upper right. Um, handsome, handsome birds. They fly with the dihedral, and that lower left picture here. I think this is great for telling a bird a long distance away. They have a fairly long tail and their wings to me look like someone has made this bird out of silly putty and then tugged at both ends of the wings and stretched it out a little bit. It narrows here a little bit more than I notice in other, other um, hawks and I, that stands out to me. It might not stand out to others but it stands out to me when I, I look at that. They have a white uh, rump that's obvious in all ages and all sexes. This again is another male, handsome, handsome face. Um, so uh, the odd birds that we have, uh, we have the osprey and the, the harrier. And now the large, real large birds that we have, we have two species of eagles, bald eagles, looks like a, a flying two by 10. Um, you can see here, uh, this is what you wanna look for when you see a large bird, uh, a fairly straight leading edge and fairly straight trailing edge and the head and the tail about the same distance stuck on either side of that flying two by 10. Female birds will, will have about an eight foot wingspan. Males will have about a seven foot wingspan. These are huge birds. Um, that's, that's a big, big bird. Um, and only the adults after uh, about four or five years so that they get the totally white head and, uh, and tail. This bird um, is crossing the bow of a ship up in um, Alaska last year, a Tauk tour I was, I was working and my buddy Paul is a tour director for Tauk and they get to see these things all the, all the time. But this bird just flew right in right in front of me, just a handsome bird. But you get a good view of how that head and tail just about the same distance from the, the wing of, uh, of, the, of the bird. And they just pluck the fish off the surface. They're one of the fish eagles. They feed a lot on fish, but they also will take carrion. And I have seen them take fairly large birds 
Um, they'll feed on uh, birds, uh, large birds, uh, been recorded great blue herons. I've seen them take white ibis in the, in the Everglades. Um, they will feed on pretty much whatever they, whatever they want to feed on. And this, Laurie will remember this, uh, this tree, this is one of our canoe adventures up to Lake Umbagog. That big pine there was the last nesting uh, tree in 1949 that bald eagles nested in the state of New Hampshire. And they went um, until 1989, a 40-year gap without adding any nesting bald eagles. And the tree that that pair that came in after 40, a 40 year absence, they nested in the same exact, not the same pair, but the same exact pine tree. That pine is long gone now. But I thought that was interesting. It's just a perfect habitat for, um, for the bald, uh, bald eagle. Uh, our other species of eagle that we have, we have here um, in the minority, we don't have as many of them. And I think they're probably seen uh, more often than they're reported. Uh, they're reported as bald eagles. This is the golden eagle. This bird feeds mostly on mammals compared to, uh, compared to fish. Uh, about the same size and wingspan as the bald eagle, but they're heavier, heavier uh, birds, golden, uh, golden eagles. And um, they have more of an S curve to their wing. The young goldens have, uh, have white on the wing and on the tail. This is the bird the Indians called the thunderbird. And um, you can see it's not as much of the flying plank that we talked about. It's more of an S curve. And the head is the golden eagle on the right. The head uh, does not appear to be as big as the tail. It's got a longer tail. Bald eagle on the left, about the same, the same size. But big, big bird. So you know it's an eagle and you have to look uh, closely at it. But a uh, quick review and then we'll, um, we'll see if anyone has any, uh, any questions. These are our, um, our four beautios at the top here. These are all immature uh, graph graphics of immature birds and um, they're proportionate in size. I just wanted to put them all together here. This is our, uh, our red tail hawk immature because it, it's got that fine banding. There's the red-shouldered uh, hawk here, and then the smallest of the buteos is the broad-winged hawk. It has a wing kind of the shape of a of a candle flame, and then we have the rough-legged hawk down here. This lower bird is not a buteo, but it's grouped in here because it's often confused with the buteo. This is the largest of the occipiters, the goshawk. You can see how it could be uh, grouped with the, the buteos if we didn't uh, didn't know better. Then the smaller birds, uh, we have the other two occipiters here. The top one is the sharp shin hawk. And then we have uh, Coopers right over here. Our northern harrier, look at the length of the tails. Um, and this is of course all proportionate. And then look at this big bird here, pointed wings, stocky peregrine falcon, merlin falcon, as the uh, the nest and then the next and then the lower bird would be the American kestrel. Our oddballs here don't really uh, fit in. Uh, osprey is at the top. Turkey vulture, black vulture right here, and then we have the immature bald eagle that can have white anywhere on its wings and body, and then we have the immature golden eagle that loses these white patches. Um, as it uh, as it matures, um, any questions about uh, about that? It's kind of hard to not uh, hear all the exuberant applause and so forth, but I'm sure it's I'm sure it's going on, yeah. and I can I can feel it a little bit. But this is my um, this is my email here for those of you that don't have it. Send me an email requesting the um, the handout. Um, I think we'll have some for Saturday, but if you're not going on Saturday, and I'll ask to see if anyone is going, uh, but I'll send you uh, just a PDF of the handout. You can print it out for yourself. But it's it's a pretty good um, a pretty good handout we've used for uh, we've used for years. So, Chris, there were a couple of questions, but Charlie Nims did a great job of answering them on chat. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Charlie's always good to have along. Sorry about that, Chris. No, it's probably, it was no, great. I, 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 I hope the you're question. coming on Saturday. 
Um, don't, don't think so, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah. Um, Let me see if we can get back on here. Yes, let's see, see if we can see your... See everybody. I have a question, Chris. Yeah. Um, are Florida Osprey resident, or do they head south also? Yeah, they're resident. And that's one reason why our birds go so far. They, you know, they leapfrog over, over those birds. And um, I mean, why go? I mean, you, you have some, if you're not a fisherman yourself, you have some fishermen that, you know, they don't want to share their good fishing holes. So if you go all the way down, if you go all the way down to Florida and you've got to compete with birds that are out there fishing the same holes all the time, it's not going to be successful. So they, uh, so they head down, uh, they, they'll head uh, down into South America. There was one uh, great, you know, we, we think we know everything. Well, Charlie thinks he knows everything, you know, bird watching, <laughs> uh, apparently. But um, we, uh, you know, we assume so much. But when we start to do some, some of the research in recent years where we've actually put telemetry on these things, we, we find out that these birds, um, you know, wander around. Uh, bald eagles sometimes don't go to the south. They'll wander around depending upon the food source. They'll go out west. They'll go south. They'll come back. Um, but the telemetry and the ospreys, a few years ago, we had a bird that uh, left the, the nesting area. I think it was up at Umbagog. And, um, and flew directly to the coast. I believe it was the South Carolina coast. And then you can see this, um, uh, you can watch it live. It, it sends out a, you know, a blip uh, every few hours. This bird took off over the, out over the Atlantic. And it continued in a straight line all the way to the coast of, all the way to the coast of Europe. And they realized it had gotten on a freighter. Yeah. They were able to identify the freighter. And it had, of course, it could feed. It was feeding along the way. And it wasn't using any energy. So out in the open ocean, it might not have been able to feed much. Um, and then it was lost. Uh, they lost the signal o over there. Um, some birds in South America, the ospreys, the signal has shown up. You can see it on Google Earth, uh, a little cabin in the forest. Obviously, someone shot the bird and ate it. So it's fascinating to see just where these uh, these these birds go with the technology that we have uh, that we have today. Chris, uh, what else did Chris, Charlie I'd, have? Yeah, I just corroborate what you said about the sharp shin hawks moving through. I've had two in the last three days, uh, uh, and this morning had one down at um, 1785 Fields, along with a uh, harrier on, on migrating, but which put on quite a good show, and then a very very high up. Um, Broadwing that I thought initially I took photos of because I couldn't ID it and I, it was so far away and I thought it was going to be a red tailed but it turned out to be a broadwing which surprised me it seems so late for that but. right right but that's what happens I mean that's what we you know we we like to have things black and white but that's what that's what happens and who knows how far this bird has been coming from yeah. uh, what delayed it possibly uh, weather or something else or Maybe it's not going to make it. Maybe it lost its migratory map and it's not going to make it. That's what's fun about this. We don't know everything. We don't know everything about it. But uh, yeah, the sharp shins um, should be, you know, we, we should have quite a few. If it's a good flight day, and what I mean by a good flight day is um, winds out of the south typically in our area here are the kiss of death. And depending upon the site, you can get a good flight with just about any other wind. You know, we we seem to see more birds flying with winds out of the north, but it also has to do with fronts that are moving through. Typically, just before a front, birds will be moving, or backed up behind a front, they'll be uh, moving through. But it's great to watch. You know, I I don't really, um, you know, mind what we see. I'm not looking for any particular species. This is, uh, Laurie, this is the latest we've ever done a hawk watch. We yeah. usually... Do them in September because you see all the broad wings and that's kind of a big show if you catch it right. But I particularly like, and I, I used to go to Hawk Mountain. Uh, we led a couple of trips to um, for Tin Mountain down to Hawk Mountain in Pennsylvania, famous hawk watching spot. Um, uh, I always like to go late, like to go in October. The bigger birds are coming through. 
you start to see big birds coming through, the birds that have been feeding on mammals and things are starting to get cold and they're starting to move through, starting to lose uh, some, of, uh, some of the bigger birds that they've been feeding on. So you get an opportunity to see, uh, to see that, um, that migration of big birds. And we, I think we should see some, uh, we should see a flight. Uh, it's supposed to be uh, rain coming in in the evening. Is that Gail? Is that Gail it is. interrupting the whole program? <laughs> Hi, Gail. You can't how take are, her anywhere, Chris. How are you? <laughs> He's talking no, well, to you. I've been looking for her in her bathrobe, <laughs> in her bathrobe there. Uh, I haven't, I haven't seen her yet. Uh, but uh, I think we might have a good flight. There's supposed to be some showers in the afternoon, but the he morning is supposed to be clear. Around town. So that might be, uh, that might be fun. <laughs> but I suggest, you know, if you're not coming on Saturday, just get out on your own. Uh, um, we've had good flights from Cathedral Edge. I've had good flights in my backyard. Just depends on, you know, the, you keep looking up. And uh, Mount Agamenicus over in, um, on the coast, uh, I, I guess it's a gunkwit or it's on the gun, a gunkwit uh, wells line someplace. That's a great, uh, just a great spot um, within reach. And Hacker's Hill, the spot that I have become very fond of in the last several years. Um, it's easy to get to. I think the um, description, Laurie says, um, after a short hike, there's really no yeah. hike. Right. Um, so anybody can, can come. And we'll stay, at a, we'll stay at a distance. And it's a 360 degree view. And, um, and it's, a nice, it's a nice place, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so anyway, we're meeting at, uh, we're meeting at nine o'clock at Freiburg Academy in the parking lot by the field house, right? And yeah, then, and then we'll, we'll go, we'll just carpool over from there, meaning cars following each other, not necessarily. Yeah, car it's caravanning it. over. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, but I would appreciate if people would still call and let us know that you're coming so we know who we're waiting for and so forth, so. Laurie, can you see everybody that's on here? Just a handful of people. If, any thumbs up of if people know that they're going? Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, hold on a second. Oh, no, that's not. Never mind. Hold on. Now I lost everybody. That one, right? I, I don't have everything. I can see it that both thumbs, both thumbs down, and they don't want anything to do with this cultish experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can't right at the moment. Um, okay. No, maybe that's one. Hey, uh, Chris and Laurie, I would say if people are interested in bald eagles, there's a great spot in November and December, yeah, local, is. relatively local here to see. It's called the uh, Carcass Dump off of Hill Road in Myland. And what they do oh. is they dump, uh, hunters put their carcasses, particularly deer carcasses, and also the Department of Transportation, if uh, deer get hit, they'll put them in this field at the bottom and the, and the eagles i had up to six at a time rick's been up to with me and joe scott mm -hmm. and we got up to half a dozen at a time i'd say from about mid-november into december and it always helps when they're fresh carcasses and i and, and i had my actually my first new hampshire uh, and only new hampshire bobcat up there too eating, eating oh carcass. nice so it's about an nice. hour drive probably from the valley well, that sounds good yeah. that sounds like i i charlie i think you should lead a trip up there hey. thanks for, thanks for volunteering to do that it's nice to uh, we'll set a day. Day. i'll do it if the, you guarantee the birds will be there <laughs> i have been there when there have been no birds but i've been there when there have been six eagles and about 50 ravens yeah. there's a ton of ravens yeah yeah uh, I think well, there's been a well island's place. always an interesting place to visit because it's right next to dumber it's, it's dumber <laughs> and dumber right that's right yeah well, that sounds good. I, I've never been up there. Yeah, it, it's, it is on eBird for those who, you know, want to look at it. I think it's called the Carcass Dump or something like that up there. Hmm. Uh, and uh, you can always get a hold of me via Laurie or something like that. Sounds like it would attract a lot of folks like us. <laughs> Meat eaters. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, Chris, thank you very much. Always. Um, thank all of, all of you for, uh, yes. for joining in. Thumbs up, clap. Thank you, Chris. There you go, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thanks. Bye bye. All right. Take care. Thanks. Yeah. Hope to see you soon. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thanks. Hey, Will, have fun out in Monhegan. Thank you. We'll see some uh, raptors out there, hopefully. Yeah. Keep your eye out for that black sort of gray. Yeah.
Black-throated gray. There was a black-throated gray warbler uh, a week or so ago up there. Wow. And something, uh, Sage Phoebe, something else of, of interest. Wow. That's exciting. I just saw that um, Peter Vickery's book is coming out um, on uh, the 3rd of November. It was finished, uh, you know, it was taken over, you know, after he died and uh, finished by uh, Charlie Duncan and um, a few other people there. Widensall, uh, Scott Widensall edited it, and it looks like it's going to be a fantastic book um, with a fantastic price tag, too, but Bird of Maine. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to, you know, see the reviews, but they look good. Something to look forward to. Yeah. Yep. Will, you just, it's not a coloring book, Will. <laughs> we'll have to get it to the Darn. I'll let you look at mine when I, when I get it. All right, thanks. Hey, are we going to see you on Saturday? You're, you're not that far off. Um, I'm not that far. I'm going to be at Freedom Town Forest in the morning. And um, okay. I'll be wrapped up by 11 or so. So if you're still out, I'd, I'd love to stop by. All right, that'd be great. All right. All right, guys. Have a good night, everyone. Take care, everyone. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Good to see you, Marjorie. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Good night.